you might know me from MC or whatever. <coughs> That's some text on a slide that like, represents me. <laughs> <laughs> this notion of language, symbols, and uh, signification. So, um, yeah, so my talk is about human language technology, translation, and free software. Um, it's similar, but not the same uh, to a talk that I gave uh, in fall at CS Club. Um, so, the major point that I want you to come away from this, this is my spilling the beans slide, is it's really exciting to be in human language technology these days for a few reasons. Um, most of them have to do with the internet. Um, so, these days, and, and kind of modern computing, you've got so much compute. You've got really, really fast processors and lots of them. So, you can do big machine learning, like, with stuff that's available to you right now. Um, you can you can do voice recognition on your phone. Like you're probably doing voice recognition on your phone. Um, you've got a lot of bandwidth, um, and people are so connected on the internet, and there's just so much data available for you to do NLP on. And so much of it is linguistic. Um, some of us are mining Twitter, uh, for example. Uh, and these days, there's so much freely available software and reading material that you can you can start right now. You can learn these things. Um, there are free classes that I'll talk about uh, in a moment that are like pretty exciting. So like you can learn all these things. Um, and there have been kind of just publicly in, uh, in human language technology some really interesting recent public successes. So things are starting to work, and it's it's cool. You know, like there's just neat stuff. So uh, these terms are roughly synonymous. Um, you hopefully have a sense of what they mean. Um, so just kind of anything that we're doing that has to do with computers and language, like computers that understand language, process language, or produce language, uh, we want to call these human language technology or maybe natu natural language processing or um, computational linguistics. Computational linguistics is a little, maybe a little bit different, but it's kind of, it kind of means like, I'm a linguist, and now I work on this. As opposed to I'm a computer scientist, and now I work on this. Whatever. Wow, this slide didn't come out very well. Um, so there's Siri and there's GLaDOS. Um, <laughs> they're not quite the same. There's Google Translate. So, so recent public successes um, in in uh, in NLP or human language technology. Who's got Siri? Is Siri cool? How does Siri work? Who the heck knows? What is it doing? So it's it's got like speech recognition, right? So it takes audio signal and figures out what you said, figures out what to do with it. It's ridiculous. Watson? He saw Jeopardy recently. Isn't that rad? That was, that was freaking amazing. And then Google Translate. Um, how the heck does that work? Who uses Google Translate? I was reading a, a, an article, a news article recently. It was in, happened to be in Polish. Somebody sent me a link to it. Or I saw it on Twitter or something. And it took me a minute to, like, I didn't notice that it was a link to Google Translate. I just thought it was a news article. But no, it was in Polish. I was reading it in English. So what else? There's, like, lots of, you know, kind of subtasks or, or things, goals that you can do with, uh, with language technology, with, with human language. You can um, do speech recognition, like we said, um, and filter spam. That's kind of a language problem. Uh, you can do a search engine. Speaking of search, have you noticed, like, sometimes you'll search for something, and it'll show you web pages that are relevant, but don't have those words in them. I did this, I, and I just this <coughs> recently, Twitter is doing this. I searched for Jerry Sanders, who was the mayor of San Diego, for whatever reason, and um, it showed me tweets that said, GOP mayor of San Diego does da 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 da. Those tweets do not contain Jerry Sanders. It knew that I meant Okay, so so like enough with the okay, that's pretty crazy. Let's talk about how it works. Well, you know, there's pieces, um, and you can learn what those pieces are. Uh, you can't really talk about those pieces because we have what 20 minutes. But what I do want to talk about a little bit is machine translation. It's one of the things that uh, I'm personally most interested in. Um, have worked on. If you go to Google Translate, just a little bit of code in it that I wrote. You can smile and think of me when you, when you use it. Um, translation is really important um, for 
for very clear <coughs> reasons. Uh, there are lots and lots of uh, languages in the world spoken by 7 billion people, right? But there's thousands of languages. Um, recent estimate was about, about 7,000 living languages in the world, depending on how you break up the boundaries between languages. But lots of them are really big. So like, who speaks more than a couple of these? I speak two of them. Probably several people in here speak two, maybe three. Anybody speak four? Okay, so there's lots of people that you can't talk to in their native language. You can't do business with them necessarily, you know, unless they also speak some other language. But, um, it's kind of a problem. How do you talk to people? So this has been a thing for a long time. Uh, machine translation is one of the oldest, um, oldest things. Basically, it's, it's about as old as computing. Um, in the 1940s, uh, people got really excited. They said, like, oh, geez, you know, we had such success with, um, with encryption. Uh, remember Alan Turing uh, and Bletchley Park? They, they, managed to do, uh, they managed to decrypt the communications of the, of the, the German military. And uh, so in the 1940s, they, they started thinking, Warren Weaver particularly, started thinking, well, geez, you know, can we use similar techniques to do translation? We have these you know, new fast computing devices. They weren't very fast. So they started working on it. Um, it went very gradually, and in the Cold War, um, the clear uh, goal was everybody uh, in the United States at least wanted to be able to translate Russian uh, into English. And that kind of dragged along. In the 1960s, um, there was a report that uh, they, they basically had to reevaluate, and they thought, like, well, this isn't working very well. Um, what are we going to do? So they, they, they kind of, there was less of an interest in doing machine translation research uh, from the 60s to the 70s. Um, and they said, well, we can't our scientists just learn Russian. It's easy enough, right? <coughs> um, so then in the 1990s, this, we started getting, you know, they had Pentium chips now, right? So the, uh, the computers were rather faster, and some researchers at IBM got the idea, well, which was actually an old idea uh, that they kind of restarted. They said, let's use statistics. They said, let's use big data, relatively big data, and let's have the system learn how to do translation instead of writing down the rules ourselves. Like, I personally don't know how to translate into Russian, but if you had a system and you showed it a zillion examples, maybe you can learn how to translate into Russian. So that's actually kind of the state of how does, <laughs> that's kind of the state of uh, of many translation systems nowadays is they're based on statistics. Um, that's not the only way to do it. But just to give you an intuition uh, for this, this is some English and some Italian. Can you find some uh, some trends here? Say like yeah. What do you got? Um, well, all the sentences talk about food. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, sure, but say like, given that the sentence talks about food in English, what word do you always see in Italian? Cubo. Cubo, yeah. So if you're a statistical MT system, you could imagine it learning. If, yeah, food is cubo. If, if, if you've got a sentence in English, and it has the word food, then the probability of it having the word cubo on the Italian side is like 100%, basically. Very, very close to that. You're going to find that that's true in the long run. So. So what if you had like thousands of sentences, hundreds of thousands of sentences, millions of sentences? What could you learn? You could learn a lot of words. You could learn all the words. Not all the words. <coughs> Lots. So that's pretty cool. Like, and this is actually, at a very like basic level, this is how Google Translate works. So what you do is you learn patterns from, from uh, examples. Lots of them. So you do words, um, you scale it up with phrases, chunks of sentences, maybe whole sentences. So you say like, um, some common sentence that somebody might say, you, you would find the correspondences and just, just memorize it, right? Just learn the probability that like this sentence translates to this sentence. Easy. You know. <laughs> so this is, this is kind of the Google thing. Well, it's not, it's not that Google is the only people that do this. This is kind of the like statistical uh, machine learning kind of approach. You have a language problem. So you turn it into a machine learning problem. 
And then what Google does is they're really good at turning machine learning problems into systems problems. Good. And that's good. So um, where do you get the examples from? Where do you think you get the examples from? Do I have a slide about that? No. I'll tell you where you get the examples from. You get the examples from uh, translated news documents. You get them from governments. Uh, many governments produce all their documents in um, several languages. For example, Canada uh, produces all their stuff in English and French. How great is that, right? Take all that stuff, <coughs> show it to your system, find all the correspondences. Um, it's pretty cool. Uh, the UN produces a lot of documents in many languages, so we can train on all those. Um, whales? Who knows about whales? Not like whales in the ocean, but like whales. <laughs> Next to England, right? They speak Welsh sometimes. Notionally, they speak Welsh. They produce all their documents in English and Welsh. So, coincidentally, statistical machine translation for English to Welsh is really good for all 12 people that want it. Right? <laughs> like, <laughs> Okay, so, so uh, statistical machine translation is not the only, uh, the only thing you can do uh, to do machine translation. Um, there's this notion of the translation pyramid uh, that kind of, uh, yes, take a picture of the translation pyramid. Um, so you could do more analysis first. So you, you, the notion is you have to get from here to here. You've got, take a uh, source text and you've got to produce the target text. The question is what do you do in the intermediate? Um, Something like a word-based statistical translation system um, is very shallow, we call it, so it stays low in the pyramid. It doesn't have any notion about meaning. Usually it doesn't even have a notion about um, uh, the syntax of the sentence. It doesn't like try to parse it or build a, a sentence diagram. Who's drawn a sentence diagram? Middle school? Diagramming sentences? Okay, if you know that, then you know parsing, which is a, a kind of a sub-problem. Um, so there are other uh, approaches to machine translation. Um, for example, there's rule-based systems where it's kind of more like a compiler. You, you uh, kind of analyze the sentence and have rules to, to change it into the output. Um, there's example-based. If you've heard of uh, case-based reasoning, you can use case-based reasoning for <coughs> translation. Um, and then hybrids uh, of these things, particularly rule-based um, combined with statistical, uh, is increasingly popular. It's what we're doing here at Indiana. Um, in, in my research and my advisor's research. Uh, and, and they're kind of more trendy in Europe. Uh, a lot of people these days are, are doing the statistical uh, approaches. Okay, so, great, great. Translation is very easy. It's not really easy. Uh, so the problem is like, what if you don't have a lot of data? So you're not doing Welsh. You know, what, what if you want to do um, some under resourced language? Uh, where there's not a lot of data available. Say, um, uh, Quechua and Guarani are um, uh, Native American languages. They're spoken in South America. Um, Amharic is spoken in Ethiopia. And um, so say we want to translate these languages, but we don't have a lot of available text. That's hard. Right? So what do we do? Um, we can write down rules. Um, if we know a little bit more about the grammar uh, of that language, we can, we can teach the system that. Uh, not through machine learning, but through just write it down. And then unlikely translation here. So I just showed you um, English to Italian. But what if you want to do, um, say, uh, Italian to Guarani? Right? I don't have a newspaper <coughs> that's simultaneously translated into both. Maybe you do. And if you do, please tell me. Because I would train on it. Um, Font. Maybe, why don't you have that font installed? Okay, so some languages, so like English and Chinese actually have very <coughs> simple words, um, but some languages have big words, and this actually makes translation hard because the likelihood that you're going to see this word is low. Um, so in Amharic, which is one language we work with particularly uh, here, um, you can construct a word that means even if it hasn't already been opened for them, that's one word, it's about this long, um, but it's a word somebody might say. But a lot of languages do that, so like Arabic does it, um, Finnish and Turkish do it. Big, complicated words, probability of seeing that word is low. So it's hard to learn how to translate that word, and you're likely to see words you've never seen before. So you have to come up with some strategy for that. 
Um, okay, so I talked enough about, well, maybe you can ask me questions later. How do you learn these things? How do you get started doing NLP? Assuming, I, I hope, that I've convinced you that NLP is interesting. I hope. And instill deep within you uh, an urge to study it, uh, or at least consider studying it. So how do you, how do, you uh, do that, right? So you can take a class. Um, Indiana offers uh, many fine classes uh, on this, but really interestingly, Stanford is offering free online classes, and this is like the Stanford NLP course. It's free online. It hasn't started yet this semester. They're like delayed. They push it back three times. What's that? They push back at all the ones this semester. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Like, so like probably later this month or like maybe early March, they're going to start an LP class. You can sign up for this and take it. You won't get like credit or whatever, but you'll have taken the Stanford LP course. That's cool. Um, I think it offers a lot of really nice classes, but you can't start this semester. Right? They've already started. Um, so they happen in the linguistics department, sometimes the cog department. Um, CS offers B651, um, which is really nice. We'll see if it happens again in the future. It's happening this semester. Um, there could be an 1898 if there was interest. You can read uh, free things online. Uh, you can read the NLTK book. I think in the title of this talk, I was supposed to talk more about NLTK. NLTK is um, this really nice uh, free software um, package for Python that lets you do um, all these NLP tasks. It has, um, it has parsers, it has uh, part of speech taggers, um, quite a few things. You can do really a lot of different interesting NLP uh, projects with NLTK. Um, and if you go to nltk.org slash book, there's a free book. It's like an O'Reilly book that they sell, but it's also free online. Um, if you want to learn more about translation, um, you can read this uh, tutorial workbook by Kevin Knight, and it's free and it's really good, and you'll learn about statistical MT. And one of the most beautiful things about, um, about computational linguistics is basically everything in the field is, is open access. You can just read all the papers. So for like, once you like really want to dive in, just like go here and read all the papers. They're hard to read. They're kind of you know, recent research. So if you like Python and you want to play with NLP, uh, you should get NLTK. Um, it's free. Um, there's a lot of really nice documentation. Um, if you like Java, um, Open NLP is nice. Um, and then Stanford has Packet, which is, and there's a few more. Um, and there's a bunch of free software uh, machine translation systems. Um, these are kind of like an increasing order of, of easy. Like Moses is kind of hard to work with. Joshua is nicer, and Ampergam is like really, really easy. If you have Ubuntu, you can just use apt to install it. Um, but these actually work in front. Well, Ampergam works very different from Moses and Joshua. But if you're interested, you can like read more and like understand the differences. Um, wow, I guess that's all I have. All the um. All the links I've talked about, and quite a few more links, um, I put, and, and these slides are at this URL. Um, so if you want these slides or links or whatever, go to this URL. Um, and, uh, I don't know, questions, thoughts? Yeah. Um, applause? Yeah. <laughs> applause. Uh, yeah, applause. Yeah. <laughs> um, a quick question before yeah. you leave my gift. Um, what do you do about languages that are uh, spoken only? That's a really good question. Um, for being awesome. <laughs> yeah, so languages that are spoken only. Um, those are usually not, well, that's a really good question. I guess all you could do to them would be like uh, speech recognition. You could try to come up with. Um, some way to transcribe them and then it's so most NLP that I personally work with starts with text. Um, I've done a little bit with speech recognition. Uh, and that's kind of a it's kind of a separate research community. Yeah, that's a really good question. There was work at Georgia Tech not too long ago on um, doing processing on uh, sign language. And that's an interesting hard problem. I don't really know how far they got, but like you know sign language is language. It's just not 
Okay. Easy to parse with a you know complex grammar. Well, I don't want to find that. Anyway. <laughs> uh, I also have this question. You talked to one of the pyramid about well, the top of the pyramid is interlanguage or some type of interlanguage that I would assume, at least in that case, explicitly is between two sources. But is there any work to kind of translate between interlanguages, or is there work on trying to create some type of unified way that you can, because uh, the priming examples, like if you have two languages that are easy to translate, and these other two languages, you can translate through an intermediary language, yeah. which makes it really easy for things like Welsh, like if something's got you know Spanish to Welsh, and then Welsh to something really weird, then you can use that. So is there any work in trying to create a interlanguage that could work between all languages or something? Yeah, like? there's a lot of work on that. Okay. Um, and opinion is divided as to whether that's a silly, I mean, it's it's a it's a really good question. Like, obviously, that's that's like a clear thing that people would want to do. Um, whether it's possible or not is kind of kind of an open question. What's done in practice, um, for example, you may have noticed like Google Translate lets you translate between like any two languages that you handle. They usually go through English, so they translate um, whatever into English. So, say if you want to use um, Hebrew to Arabic, I know for sure that they go Hebrew, English, Arabic. And you can like observe because it, it actually makes mistakes that you, you wouldn't make if you went straight Hebrew Arabic. Um, I have two questions. First one is: so you said that a lot of status, status for data are from government documents or uh, some text, but what about the slang? Slangs are broken, like not full sentences that people can try to search. That that actually brings up uh, one other interesting source of data that people have used um, is the web. Which is, so Google is doing this, for example. Um, they, they published a paper, um, which I can put up the link to. But they actually mine the web and like find all the documents that they think are translations of other documents. It's kind of a big, imagine. <coughs> okay, for each document, is this document a translation of this other document? This time? Right. It's, it's kind of a big search problem, but they're doing it. Um, yeah, so hopefully that'll catch the slang. But it's it's a general problem. Like, what do you do for words you've never seen before? Um, for translation, that's hard. If you've never seen a word before, you usually just just give it the output, or or you could fail. You could say, I can't translate the sentence. My second question is: so besides uh, translation or web search, where is this being used? Where is NLP being used? Yeah. So well, there's like spam filtering. Um, I, don't, I mean, there's there's like just any kind of interface where you where you present numbers to the computer and it decides what to do. Speech recognition. Speech recognition. Yeah. Um, sentiment analysis is kind of a big one. Uh, did anybody see Johan Bolin's talk mm -hmm. earlier? Yeah, Johan is big into that. So uh, or opinion mining. So like, given a large set of documents, you know, how do the how do the authors feel about this thing? It's kind of an interesting question. Uh, and and. Uh, very uh, kind of pragmatic business question to ask. Any more questions? Let's give a round of applause. Okay.